Hi, welcome to Facebook Live. Uh, today we're doing a Q&A with Evanston Mayor Stephen Haggerty. Uh, my name is Bob Seidenberg. I've been a, a local journalist in Evanston for many, many years. And uh, I'm on loan for this interview from the uh, Evanston Roundtable. Great. Uh, and they have a pretty busy schedule this week with all the stories uh, from uh, I'm the other night. I'm sure they do. Uh, and uh, Mayor uh, Stephen Haggerty, um, you know, um, just to start it off, uh, it was a busy uh, Monday night city council meeting. It was a busy Monday night council meeting, and you know what ran particularly long, right, was uh, the administration and public works committee, and then we had the planning and development committee. So we always do those meetings before, as you know, um, and they ran long. So we didn't even get council started till about 9.15 or 9.30, if I, re if I recall, uh, and then had a robust group for public comment, as we, as we normally do. Um, I'd be remiss also to say, Bob, it's great to have you here today. I'm, I appreciate you uh, joining us, and, and just so folks out there that are watching know, you're free to ask any questions. You know, uh, you're a, a close observer, and I know a lot of people are happy to have you back in the city council chambers um, uh, but your close observer of what's going on around town and lots of people that are watching or will watch this uh, recording later um, follow things closely as well so I know we've got lots of questions and I'm excited to uh, try and uh, uh, give people my thoughts uh, and my opinions if I have one have them on on their particular questions okay well we actually have a very timely one just what we were talking about from Mary O'Rourke Rosinski mm. um, her question was, can you do anything to have the city council meetings start on time and have committee meetings scheduled for another day? Yeah, so it's a great question, and Mary is a, definitely an active uh, community member, comes to a lot of council meetings, and I understand her frustration. It's not just hers. Other, other people have it. Uh, so the Rules Committee of the Evanston City Council is the one who sets up sort of all the rules and the parameters in which we run our meetings. Um, that Rules Committee has had discussions in the past about you know, whether the committee meetings can somehow be abbreviated, moved to a different day, um, and we've made some um, adjustments. So for the APW, Administration Public Works Committee, we now have a consent agenda, whereas before they didn't, and they would go through every single item. So now there can be a consent agenda read there. They take, uh, they approve all the ones that there are no issues about, and they pass unanimously, and then the other issues they talk about. There's been mixed feelings about whether you change the committee meetings and put them on another day. Uh, and one of the challenges certainly is that, you know, our aldermen and our mayor, for that matter, service part time uh, employees, lots of members have other jobs. And so there's been a decision, um, but it's revisited periodically to do this uh, all on Monday nights. Uh, but when we have particularly um, uh, controversial or just a lot of issues on one agenda, it pushes city council. So um, I don't, you know, what I would suggest to Mary or anybody else that's frustrated by this is come to the next rules committee meeting. I think it may be in, I think that's in August, but check the city schedule. Uh, it's the first Monday every other month. Um, come to that and, and voice that concern uh, on behalf of residents um, because I get it. And it's hard for council members too. I mean, we're up there at 11 o'clock at night. You know, I had gotten up at four in the morning. I know Alderman Braithwaite had, you know, my, uh, uh, you know, brain wasn't functioning uh, as sharp as it, as it would at eight o'clock at night. So, but that's, that's sort of where we stand. So, you know, it's a conversation for the rules committee, um, but we've had that conversation before. And I think with the exception of Monday night, we're, uh, I think they've been, we've been doing a better job starting these council meetings earlier around the 7 to 7.30 time frame up until this past Monday. Well, and I know as mayors presiding over the meetings, there's kind of a balance. You want to you wanna allow a lot of public uh, uh, comment and yes. feedback and everything, but you also have to conduct business, and there's, it's kind of a It, it is a balance. Situation. I'm glad you mentioned it. It's a totally a balance, um, and, you know, I can tell you, I got a couple letters and people that were upset from the prior meeting where a woman got up and wanted to make a statement for somebody else who had to leave and was not feeling well. And after she made her personal statement, she said, oh, I want to now read the statement from the other person. And we had like 30 people for public comment. People didn't have that much time. We were over or getting close to being over our 45 minute allotment. So I said, hey, why don't you give it to the city clerk and, um, and, we'll, and we'll file it. And, um, 
you know, and it was somebody that had spoken before, and I sort of said, oh, this is, you know, we sort of know how this person feels on that issue, um, which was, you know, seen by her and so I think a couple other people as dismissive or presumptuous, and I get that in, hi in hindsight. Um, so it is this fine, fine balance. I mean, there are aldermen that are like, Mayor, you got to, you know, crack down and, and get through this quicker. I'm trying to strike that right balance, and inevitably, uh, there's there are people out there that don't think I have. <laughs> so that's just the nature of the job, honestly. Uh, but but we're trying to, and that's what they're trying to do in the committees as well. And that's why some of these run run long. Um, yeah. And, and just a, just a, a question, as a long time yeah. observer. Yeah. When people are, you know, giving public comment, and I think it's 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 one and a half minutes or whatever. <clears throat> well, it, it could be up to three minutes, but if they're more than fifteen, because we have a lot forty five, if there's more than fifteen, then it gets cut down. Of course, we never have <clears throat> more than fifteen in Evanston. Spe speakers, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you're sitting up there now, and this is yeah. you're you're halfway through yep, your first halfway. turn. Yep, halfway. Yeah. What do those points do? Do those points filter into the discussion? Is there is there a really kind of an effective way of making your point? You yeah. Know, so I would say uh, what I've learned in the two years that I've been on here is that for, um, for a significant number of issues, you know, there are several aldermen that are on the fence about how they're going, how they're going to vote. So to the extent that you have aldermen that are on the, on the fence, you know, your input at public, com at public comment you know, matters. Now, I know it's frustrating for some people because they get up there, they'll ask questions, or they feel like they want a dialogue, right? And we, at Public Comment, it's really an opportunity for the public to provide their input. It's not for this dialogue. Sure. Uh, and then we have the conversation when we get into the issues. But, um, uh, yeah, so. Now, I, I know in your uh, State of the City address, <clears throat> you, you talked about 2018 being a difficult year with the yeah. budget and everything else. Yeah, yeah. Um, 2019, how would you describe it so far? Uh, I know a couple of things have yeah. kind of dominated discussion, while yeah. other things like Harley Clark are kind of in the background. Right. I mean, Harley Clark's in the background right now because of the RFP is out. And if you have a great idea and some money behind it for Harley Clark, please uh, come onto the city website and look at the request for proposal. I think that's due in January uh, is when that will close. Um, but the um, uh, you know, going into 2000, you know, 20, uh, and then 2021. I mean, I think the budget's going to continue to be, you know, a challenge and an, and an issue. Uh, the council made a, worked hard last year to try and balance that uh, between a variety of things of reducing expenditures, increasing certain fees, uh, and you know, we know this year. Um, that we're going to have to absorb another million dollars of the debt service for the new Robert Crown Community Center. Um, and so it won't be till this fall that we have a better idea of where our revenues came in 2019. That, If there's anything that's sort of frustrating to me, it's that um, even though we're sitting here in July, because of the nature of the revenue cycle in right. the city, you don't have a great sense of where we stand on our revenues until really the, the end of the third quarter, September, October. And then the city manager has a better sense of, yeah, our revenues are coming in where we projected, or maybe they're higher and we're getting more revenue, which would be positive, or they're lower, and then all of a sudden we've got to make more adjustments in the final quarter of the year. Gotcha. Uh, regarding revenues and costs and everything, yep. uh, Robert Crown, yep. uh, pretty um, pretty dominant site in, in kind mm. of the, yes. uh, you know, the way yes. it's going up. Yep. There's a lot of questions on that. Uh -huh. uh, and um, let's, um, one of the uh, questions is, uh, what will be done? This is from Mara John Terrence, and I'm sorry if I uh, you know, uh, garble uh, name. What will be done to ensure equitable access to the new Robert Crown Community Center, particularly the gym? Right, right. So great, great question. Uh, in fact, Monday night this came up from some folks as well. Um, I think ultimately for Robert Crown, we want there to be some open access to the gymnasiums, just like there are at other you know facilities, whether it's Fleetwood, uh, Chandler, Newburger. Uh, we have open access to the gym, so our parks director is going to certainly look at that. I think where the issue is coming up on um, Robert Crown is because Beacon Academy, who's one of the funders for that project. Um, has said, you know, as part of the half a million dollar gift that we're making, we'd like to have some.
some access to the gym. Um, and we've certainly heard the feedback from residents and concerns, uh, and the city's taken a hard look at it, you know, at that agreement. That agreement hasn't officially come before the city council, uh, but I know the parks director and the, de the assistant city manager are, you know, talking to Beacon some more about that. Um, but what I would tell you is that none of our gyms around town are open to the public 24 hours a day. I mean, as part of our parks and rec services, we offer all sorts of programs mm. throughout the community mm -hmm. that people oftentimes are paying fees to participate in. And for that time, the gym's not open. And the same goes for the ice, you know, ice skating rink. Do we have open ice skating? Yes, we do. Um, there's a small fee that you pay during that period. But, uh, you know, we want to look for the same thing for the gymnasium there. We're not looking to lock down the gymnasium so that the public doesn't have some access to it. Um, but it is different, I will just add, it is different right now than the way the gymnasium works in the current Robert Crown, which was sort of a design flaw because we had the early Head Start program there. And um, because of that, you know, that gymnasium has not been as used as it you know, could be or should be in the new gym will. The Robert Dickerson, um, actually uh, this is, <laughs> I'm taking this a little out of order, mm -hmm. but That's fine. he says regarding the new Robert Crown building, what is our current estimate of annual revenue for all spaces and services provided? That's kind yep. of a... Uh -huh. Can you actually, can you answer that? I can I? answer that. I Whoa. can answer that, Bob. I, uh, <laughs> it takes me a while, but once some of the numbers sink in, and I know a lot about the numbers of, wow. of Robert Crown. Um, so the forecast uh, for the, the new Robert Crown is that it will generate about $2.6 million in revenue. Um, and... Um, that is about a million dollars more than the current Robert Crown. Okay. Now the expenses of the new Robert Crown are going to be higher, but what I can tell you is that um, we operate our community centers at a loss. Remember, overall, I'm just uh, it's a wide swath here, but let's say we spend $12 million a year in parks and rec. The revenue that we take in um, is about six million. Okay. okay, so we have a deficit there of six million. Now, I think one of the essential purposes of government is to, you know, provide, you know, wellness to the city, um, uh, athletics to the city, all the stuff that people get out, and we build a lot of community around these around these centers. Um, and so that's a loss. Some people have said, hey, you know what? You shouldn't use these unless we can cover all the costs, meaning we bring in revenue of $12 million. I do not believe that to be um, the way that we should operate. I don't think you're going to find many parks and rec services around the country that operate that way. Um, but at the end of the day, with the new Robert, Robert Crown, we will bring in more revenue. Our expenses will be higher, but our net loss okay, will be less on the new Robert Crown than it is on the current Robert Crown. Really? Yes, and which is a positive thing, again, for the city. We're going to use some of that delta to set up a maintenance fund to make sure uh, we do uh, a better job maintaining that facility than we have the old for facility. Sure. For sure. Um, do you view it, the, the new Crown as mm -hmm. a game changer in terms of uh, services or programs? or? I I, I do think that, uh, you know, they, they got this tagline, uh, you know, Evanston's crown jewel. Um, it is the most used community center that we have in Evanston. Over 100,000 people go through it. They think with the new uh, crown, it'll be closer to 200,000 people u using it. Um, I would just say to anyone, you know, if you love sort of the diversity of Evanston, go to Crown, you know, sometime during the summer. I was just there recently. I mean, all walks of life are at, at the Crown Center, you know, here um, in Evanston. And I think that that's really important for, again, people of different, you know, income and races and ethnicities, you know, to, to play with one another, live with one another, uh, work with one another. And I think the new crown uh, is really going to highlight that, you know, the, the having the library there and a branch library there, I think is huge. We don't have one uh, really in that part of town. It's really going to serve the south west part of Evanston. Um, and I can just tell you as a kid that grew up, you know, sort of in community centers or at YMCA, uh, 
days. I was blessed because the, the library was across the street. Our, our public library was across the street from the Y. And so many times my mom was like, hey, I'm not going to be able to pick you up until 6 o'clock. And I finished up at 5 o'clock. You'd go over to the library. And I think we're going to see a lot of that here with the new Robert Crown. So I think that's a game changer. There are not many facilities in the United States that are going to offer you know, early childhood education, a public library, you know, indoor ice rinks, 200,000 plus square foot of turf fields, uh, which means those fields will be used a lot more than they are today. There aren't many, and I think that um, it, it really is going to be an attraction for Evanston. I recognize it's a big investment and a big commitment. It's not something that the city council made lightly. They have been working on. In fact, in fact, the prior councils, as you know, have been working on this for quite some yeah. time. So uh, I think it's a it's a huge um, gain for all of Evanston. I know in your state <clears> of the city um, address, you said, you know, is this a significant amount in the investment? Yes. And there may be some real reallocating of, of, yes. um, yeah. of assets. Yeah. Or? I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I, uh, I, I use this term of reallocating assets. And what I mean by that is the city of Evanston has a lot of assets. We own parking garages. Uh, we own, you know, different facilities. Uh, and I think we need to take a hard look at some of those assets and ask ourselves, are we you know, using this in the best and highest use possible? Uh, and if we're not, uh, what kind of return could we get on that asset if we you know, sold a parking lot, for instance, or you know, did something different with our civic center, which is a conversation we've had many, many years ago, a decade or longer ago. Um, but I think that these are important questions. I mean, again, if you just use the civic center as one example, you know, we just recently put $600,000 into the elevators here. We put a ton of money into a building that honestly is way more building than we need to run the city of Evanston. Mm -hmm. And so I just use that as an example. These are complicated things. They need to be explored. But the city council did direct the city manager's office uh, to begin that process. And, you know, if we go down that road, it'll be a very public process, as I think all things are. We try to make all things here in Evanston a public process. Well, there will be lots of input. And inevitably, like all of our issues here in town, there will be people with different opinions. And that's, that's the nature of government and how we work. Continuing along, keep it at this yep, uh, yep. lofty level, Mike mm -hmm. Hunt asks, will you release your tax returns so we know you're not making money off of Robert Crown? Okay. All right. So uh, we can take national issues and bring them down to the local local level. Uh, and um, so here's uh, so here, here's the, the deal on, on Robert Crown. Uh, that I want to make sure, and I've said this at City Council, uh, there are over 1,200 people that have participated in the Friends of Crown campaign. Uh, my family is one of the 1,200 that have participated in this. Uh, I have no, uh, so we've given money and we're, we're going to continue to give money to, uh, to the new Robert Crown as philanthropists. I have no um, financial stake whatsoever in any of the companies that are doing work with, the Rob, with Robert Crown. Uh, every single year, I and all the elected officials in town fill out a financial disclosure form. Anybody here in Evanston can access that financial disclosure form. Uh, and it lays out money that I give to you know lots of different organizations and everything else. Um, I do think we need to draw the line uh, somewhere here about, um, you know, Alderman, you can't participate in this vote because you've given money to this organization or that. The nonprofits in Evanston, and if we are going to disqualify people because you know they gave a hundred bucks to a certain organization, because there have been people that said you need to recuse yourself from everything related to Crown because you may or have given some money to the campaign. And they've said, Alderman Wilson, you need to recuse yourself because your kid goes to Beacon right. Academy. Right. I mean, where does where does this end? Honestly, if we wanted to go down that road, we'd have nobody giving uh, either nobody giving money to any organization because they want to you know serve the public, or we'd have nobody that's able to serve the public because they've given to things. So uh, sometimes we, we we go to wild extremes, and uh, you know, in the case of of my tax returns, I comply with all of the financial requirements rules that the county sets, that the city sets, I'll continue to comply with those. And I have personally no financial interest in the new Robert Crown Community Center. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Lynn Linnea has a series of questions. Okay. Uh, first is, what is being done to ensure ETHS graduates can afford to live in Evanston? Okay, well great, thanks for that question. Um, 
you know, we care a lot about the affordability of Evanston. Um, I also uh, care a lot about making sure that Evanston is a community that not only people that grow up here and, you know, decide to, to return to Evanston or, or stay in Evanston their whole life. I hope it's a community that, you know, we also attract people. You know, it's not just I was born here, I was raised here, I went to school here, I took my job here, I got married here, you know, uh, and on and on. I'm going to die here. Uh, uh, what makes us a great community is that we do have people that were born and raised here, and then we have people like myself, uh, who I'm celebrating my 20-year anniversary here in Evanston. We moved here 20 years ago in 19, that summer of 1999. But I think, you know, we cannot think that we have all of the answers uh, right here uh, in Evanston. Um, and we want to have people that have seen, you know, honestly, the world and the country and come back. So uh, when it comes to affordability, yes, we're thinking about the people here uh, that are growing up here in Evanston. And we're doing lots of things related to, to, to housing affordability to the extent that we can. Again, big, huge macro changes. But the other thing that I'd say specifically to ETHS um, graduates is uh, there is a strong focus on workforce development, particularly for students that are not going on to not going on to college, so alternative, you know, or other careers, which there are great careers out there. And the Mayor's Employer Advisory Council, led by Neil Gambo, uh, which has over 60 members of employers, workforce development groups. Um, ETHS, Oakton Community College, they're all part of this. And they are on a mission to make sure that at least 100 students that graduate from ETHS um, every year are getting into, uh, are getting good jobs and careers here in Evanston that don't require a college degree. Uh, so I think that's probably, Lynn, the, the biggest uh, thing that we're doing there, along with, again, some of the efforts of the council uh, on affordable housing, which I can go in later if we we have a question there. Well, that answers yeah. so another question she said. Outside of the movie theater, what can kids under the age of 18 do in this city? Oh, boy. I mean, <laughs> I think there's a lot that they can do. I have a teenager myself, so I get, like, lots of times kids are like, I'm bored. I don't have, I don't have anything to do. But, I mean, obviously through ETHS, right, one of the greatest high schools in America, we've got, you know, tons of offerings for students there, whether it's in the performing arts, the, the, the sports, you name it. There's lots of opportunities there. We also have an incredible Parks and Rec Department here, which offers activities, right, uh, for for students, um, including like rollerblading at uh, at Fleetwood Jourdain. Um, obviously, we have our beaches in the summer when it's like 95 today. It's a great day to be at the beach. Um, we have a teen pass there for anybody 14 to 18 years old. You can go to any community center, get the teen pass, and it's like 10 punches. You can go to the go to the beach, so you don't even have to pay. So we and if you fill that up, you. And come and get another one. So we've got that that for students. Uh, we've got the open gyms, you know, at, at different times at our community centers. Um, so I think that there there are activities, but I also realize there isn't a bowling alley, and people are like, hey, and I hear this from other younger people, I want a bowling alley, and part of that again is related to the market forces and the market saying, yeah, I could bring a bowling alley to Evanston and and be profitable. Um, the same, uh, uh, Lynn Linia. Mm -hmm. Uh, ask, uh, why aren't there residential restrictions for police officers? Okay. Okay. So uh, another good question, the question that we get uh, at different times, Lynn. Um, so here's the thing. I think it cuts both ways. Uh, I think there are folks that think, man, I would really like our police officers embedded in the community. Mm -hmm. They would know people uh, here in, in a deeper way than if they don't live here. Um, from an officer's perspective, and I've talked to many of our police officers, they say, you know, I come to town and part of my job, not all of my job, but part of my job is to be the disciplinarian, so to speak, and say, hey, Bob, you're breaking the rule. You can't you know, be on your skateboard on the sidewalk or, or whatever it may be. And so for those officers, you know, being able to you know, live in Skokie or live in Lincolnwood or some other community nearby for them means um, uh, you know, being able to relax in a way and feel like, you know, their children and their sure. family is not having to, to deal with some uh, of uh, offshoot of their job 
here here in Evanston. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, we also have the affordability issue that we talk that we talked about before. Uh, our firefighters, our police officers, our teachers, all of that are public servants. You know, certainly we would like them, and we would like to encourage them to live here. But our challenge is again one of finances. Like any city, we don't have enough money to create a program that would further incentivize it, where we could help, let's say, contribute mm-hmm. for a down payment. Some of the universities right. uh, around the country do this. Uh, we're not. And in, 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 uh, we don't have the means to do that. So that's sort of the, some of the, some of the background there for why we don't have that residency requirement. I think you take Chicago. Chicago does. I, what they benefit from is a much much larger geographic right. area, and I think uh, a much. Um, they just have greater options of you know home prices and rental prices at the lower end of the market than sure. we do. Uh, Kathy Pilat or. Pillet mm. asks, uh, what vision do you have for making Evanston a city that works for residents as they mm. age here? Mm. Yeah. So, uh, great question, Kathy. Thank you. And again, I talked before about the diversity of Evanston. You know, that also includes the age diversity of Evanston. And mm. there's something special about living in a community where you have so many kids being born at St. Francis or Evanston Hospital, babies being born to, you know, people in their 90s, right, living living here. Um, and we want to be a, a community where people can age in place, um, so to speak, and, and stay in Evanston. Um, we continue to have uh, the age-friendly task force mm-hmm. here uh, in Evanston that's working hard. They bring ideas forth to us. The Levy Center continues to be a really vibrant place with activities, you know, for older uh, Evanston residents. Uh, On the affordable housing front, we are looking at uh, a couple affordable housings that would be for seniors, okay, one over here in the first ward, another one over in the eighth ward that have been up before the council. We're talking about putting some affordable Um, funding dollars that we have towards those projects okay Um, so all of that's part of it and then I'll just give one final example when we're designing our our uh, our city is designed but when we're making improvements and modernizing things we are taking you know age friendliness in into account Um, and so that includes like a complete streets approach when we redid Chicago Avenue and Sheridan Avenue we put the bike lanes in we put more crosswalks there, we shortened up the width of the streets, just making those streets safer for everybody, for pedestrians, for bicyclists, for kids, for old, for older residents. Um, and an example of that comes down to the work we just did recently on, Sher- on um, Sherman, downtown near the Fountain Square. If you recall, at one point in our time, I think it was in the 70s, we replaced sidewalks with brick. Right. And we made the brick sidewalks. The brick sidewalks are, you know, lousy for anybody, really, of any, of any age. But as you get older, you are more prone to trip. And these brick sidewalks are terrible. So that's just one physical example of changes that right. we're making to be, you know, age, age friendly, where we took all the brick out, just used a little strip there for decorative purposes. And now it's a much smoother, safer surface for all, for all of us. Last thing I would say on the age friend, friendliness is just yesterday, or this week, because I got a couple texts from folks, um, Kiplinger's uh, uh, rank Evanston as one of the top uh, 10 cities to age in Evanston. Um, so they're rec- it's outside of Evanston, they're rec- recognizing it as a pretty age-friendly uh, kind of place. But uh, we continue to look for improvements that we can make in that area. And again, the age-friendly task force is a big part of helping us. I think I once heard that the tiles used in one of those sidewalks, it was modeled after like a mall in Colorado or something. Oh, really? Yeah, and it didn't work. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh -uh, uh -uh. Uh-uh, uh-uh. In fact, Lisa Milman Levine (coughs) asked, has the city reflected on its response during the extreme cold days? Mm. Are there any changes, improvements, or at a minimum, a commitment to keep previously advertised community spaces open? Yeah, so great question, Lisa, and thank you for that. So let's just talk about climate change for a second and we'll get into the details of this. Climate change is real. It's happening. I think the vast majority of people in Evanston recognize that. We just did the third adaptation of our climate action and resiliency plan, the CARP, here in Evanston. Uh, We have some really bold um, commitments that we've made in that, um, which I think is appropriate. We've always been a leader and will continue to be a leader. The big issues with climate change, uh, it's not only the, the really cold weather that we could get 
in the winter. We're actually, they're projecting, and I was at a conference recently with one of the leading climate scientists uh, who talked just about the Midwest. They're projecting less snow, but when we have snow or we have cold periods, it's gonna be colder and more snow than we've had before. We're gonna have more precipitation and rain during the spring, which we saw absolutely this year. And then during the summer periods, we're gonna have hotter and drier summers. Mm. Okay, so I think, Lisa, in terms of this question, we need to be thinking about it from two angles. One, the one that you're talking about, which is um, the, the really cold polar vortex kind of days. And then in the summertime, we really need to start thinking, and our sustainability director, Kumar Jensen, and others in town are, about how we're gonna handle these periods where we have one week, two weeks of intense heat. And people die because of the heat, and people can sure. die because it gets so cold. Um, last year, uh, during the polar vortexes, the city did uh, sort of scramble, okay, but it was a couple days. We saw that the temperatures were dropping, and I was on a bunch of emails and sent some and said, hey, what are we doing here? I was really proud of the work of the Interfaith community, mm -hmm. really proud of the work of Connections for the Homeless here in Evanston, and I was proud of, this, of the city. They opened up Fleetwood Jourdain, they opened up the Levy Center, but I think there was some issues, as Lisa refers to, with just communication about that. So moving, moving forward and recognizing that there are significant weather changes and climate changes going on, you know, the city will be better prepared to communicate that uh, to, to people about what's going on. Uh, the other thing I would say is sometimes in this world that we live on with social media, things move so quickly um, on social media and people sometimes take that as, aha, that is the fact. Um, and you know, if you're not sure, uh, you know, pick up the phone and call 311 in Evanston and say, hey, you know, what's going on here? Uh, if you're out there and you're listening to this and you're saying, well, I want to help people during those times, I would really uh, suggest that you get with either Interfaith Action, Sue Murphy is the executive director there, or Connections for the Homeless and say, hey, how can I be part of a team that helps during these really cold periods or these to come really hot periods? Interesting. Uh, Marcy, mm -hmm. Marcy Rubin asks, what steps will the city take to engage residents, stakeholders, and the community in development decisions going forward. Okay, uh, development's always a heated topic, or as you know, as you know, Bob here here in Evanston, um, and uh, the way that the way that I sort of look at it is, uh, you know, we've developed this great town over the years, um, and there's always been heated debate, okay, and controversy, whether it was the new Mather buildings, whether it was, and again, you were around for covering a lot of this stuff, uh, whether it was the movie theater, yeah. you know, which I think people, many people today would look and say, oh, I think that's a great yeah. addition, but at the time, it was a scary proposition, yes. it was change, that's not going to change, okay, whenever we come up with it. I think the city does have a pretty extensive process when it comes to planned developments here in Evanston, um, but but still, at the end of the day, there are some people, you're either on the, you know, the winning side or the losing side, depending on how you feel about whether something should be developed, that are um, upset because you know, their point of view didn't prevail. And when their point of view didn't prevail, they often think, oh, there wasn't enough public communication or something was hidden that we didn't, that we didn't know about. At, the, at least in the two years I've been here, I haven't seen any big conspiracies. <laughs> I haven't seen any really. Um, and you know, does the city make some mistakes sometimes? Absolutely. I, you know, I've, I've seen that. Do we do things and go, oh, I wish we had done that differently um, and communicated this better? Sure. Um, but I think at the end of the day, the council, just like our residents, are all trying to figure out what's best for the city. Um, and you know, we'll continue to have the DAPR process, which is the city staff. We'll continue to have the plan commission look at things, ZBA when it's appropriate. We'll have the planning and development committee look at it. Then it goes to the city council. I mean, right there is a five, six step process, okay? And there's public comment allowed in all of those. And it's more than just public comment. People come and meet with their aldermen. They meet with the mayor. They send us emails. They send in petitions. There's a lot of opportunity. Uh, I just say at the end of the day um, to folks, and I know this annoys some folks, but we're a city of 75,000 people. And 
you know, this is not as simple as when there's an issue before the council, we count how many people are for something, how many people are against something, and then just vote along those lines. It's not representative democracy. You know, we practice representative democracy, and, and we um, encourage um, and live, you know, active, you know, participation from our residents. That's, that's the way it works in all, in all governments, and, and I think that's appropriate, and people will have the opportunity um, you know, they have the opportunity to provide public comment. The aldermen do their jobs and have to vote. And you know, a couple of years from now, when we have the new elections, aldermen will decide whether they're going to run or, again or not. And the voters will decide whether they like the direction the city's taking or not. And decide whether they want to vote for them again or vote for somebody else. Yeah, Simple I, I know as that. In the, like, the library <laughs> lot, there's, there's yes. been a lot of discussion. Yes. And it's, it's gone a lot of different ways. But yeah. sometimes, we, sometimes you know, there, in that case, there were a couple of committees which <clears throat> uh, recommended against it for certain reasons, but the council has to look at it from a more overall perspective. Would that be correct? Or I think they, I think they do. Um, remember, I mean, our, our committees, uh, whether it's the plan commission or, or ZBA, I mean, we have a bunch of ordinances and rules, and they're really supposed to apply apply those. But at the end of the day, the people that are on the plan commission or ZBA, as you know, are not elected. The elected officials are sitting up at the dais on mon on Monday evenings, and ultimately they're the ones that that get to make the decision. So you saw this just on Monday night. So on Monday night, the zoning and uh, ZBA uh, committee had uh, recommended that we not approve a curb cut, right. okay, for a prop for a property. Um, and the deal is that property had a curb cut there. Okay, previously they took the house down, they're building a new house, they have alley access. So they read the rules very strictly and said no curb cut. Right. And the council said, you know what, they had a curb cut before, it seems, you know, appropriate and on a nine to zero vote approved, you know, that resident doing doing their curb cut. So um, at the end at the end of the day, I would say that Committees, the opinions of committees and the work of committees matters. I encourage people to, to be on committees here. Um, and I would say probably, you know, 75, 80% of the time, that recommendation from the committee is accepted by the city council. But, you know, a quarter of the time or 20%, the city council goes in a different direction, and that's their prerogative. Janet uh, Sushinsky asks What have you done since being elected to become more aware of your white privilege? Hmm and learn about racial equity. What are you currently doing to address white privilege in our community? Okay, uh, so thank you for that question, Janet. Um, equity is, uh, is a big deal, okay? And it, not just for the city of Evanston, for our Evanston Public Schools, uh, and, and, for me, and for me personally. Um, I spend uh, a lot of time communicating and, and, and interacting uh, with our equity and empowerment co coordinator here, um, again, demonstrating our commitment as Evanston to that, to you know, the recent reconciliation resolution and working with Alderman Fleming and, and others sort of behind the right. scenes on, on the process and how we you know, move forward with that, to taking training. I mean, I'm one of maybe three people on the dais that have taken um, you know, beyond diversity training, okay. right? Not super comfortable, right? You're in there, uh, but really important, right? To understand, again, your white privilege. I think I do have a very good understanding of my white privilege, but, you know, there will be others that say, absolutely not, the mayor's out of touch, and, and, and so forth. And that's just, again, sort of the nature of, of the job. Um, you know, I mean, we put on, and I sort of encouraged it, uh, the play of ID, uh, which was um, done by Mudlark and William Eason. Uh, that was out there in the community, and we brought, brought that back uh, for multiple showings. Um, and I think that's important. Obviously, the appointment of the equity and empowerment sure. community. Uh, I spend uh, you know, a fair amount of time with the faith community here in Evanston. Um, and I would just say, as I said during the campaign for mayor, um, I think one of the biggest issues uh, before this country and our city is the growing inequality.
gap that exists, okay? However you want to define that gap, wealth gap, income gap, opportunity gap, uh, achievement gap, uh, you could go on and on. I think that is the biggest issue. I think climate change is a huge issue too, uh, but this is one of the biggest sort of human issues that we have and we need to address that. And one of the ways that we're addressing that is through um, an equity lens here in Evanston uh, in the policy decisions. And what I hope moving forward, Janet and others, is that we actually see See, you know, policies and practices changed here in Evanston, um, which help address that. Uh, kind of a related question mm -hmm. from Linda Del Bosque: Is there a plan in place for 2020 to create a position for bilingual employees? Mm. Um, so I've met with. Um, uh, some of the Latino community here in the office on, on a few occasions and this is absolutely something that is a priority of theirs. We know that the Latino population is growing in, in Evanston. It's over I think it's over 10% now. I think the 2020 census and let me just put a plug in for the 2020 census coming up. Really big deal for, for all of us. And if you're out there and you're listening to this or you want to figure out a way to get involved, you know, work with an organization here in town that is getting people to fill out that census. Okay, because we need an accurate representation of all the people. Okay, there's all this craziness about the citizen question and all of that. Right, right now, that's off, that's off the table. Uh, we'll see where that goes, but we need to be out there getting everybody here um, to, complete, to complete that census. Um, but back to, to Linda's question, um, it would be ideal, right, for us to have sort of a, a Latino you know, liaison here in the community um, and to help with the language and to translate and all of that. I think we're going to have that discussion. We're doing a survey right now mm -hmm. here in the city, uh, and we'll have that discussion in budget season about whether you know we can bring on you know a Latino uh, liaison and coordinator here for the city. So that would be probably the September October time frame that we'll see that uh, discussion. Rachel Human asked, uh, mm -hmm. Human asked, what will be Evanston's policy and action on the use of a DH? SEM truck mm. in our city, regardless of the name change of a name change mm. or omission of the DHS letters. Okay, you, you can translate that. Yeah, so just so for people that are listening, like, okay, where's this question coming from? So the Custer Street Fair right. uh, a few weeks ago it was on Father's Day weekend. Uh, the emergency management director for the city of Evanston, Kimberly Cull, who's the division chief at the fire department, um, who I think is doing an excellent job, uh, recognized that one of the risks at that fair and vulnerabilities is that we were not barricading um, that fare. And whether it's accidentally or intentionally, there are cases of you know, vehicles driving into different fares and, and people dying. Um, safety is our number one priority. Okay, let me be very clear on that. Uh, so she put up a, a perimeter around there of barricades. One of those was a Cook County vehicle. It was the Cook County Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Services Mobile Command Center. A mobile command center basically is a center that has a bunch of technology inside this van. It has a bunch of stations. Um, it can monitor the weather. Um, it can, if God forbid something happens, be the command post, okay, where they're working and coordinating the entire response. These are very common vehicles. You'll find them all, all, around, the, all around the United States. Um, uh, fair started at 9 o'clock on Saturday. By 11 o'clock, some people had taken to Facebook. Uh, they didn't call the mayor. They didn't call the fire chief. They didn't call the police chief uh, and say, hey, I've got some concerns about this van, um, and here's what my concern is. And the concern was, wow, this looks like a really imposing um, vehicle. Okay, it has DHS on it. You wouldn't know unless you were reading the fine print that this is Department of Homeland Security for Cook County, not not here. The president is out there talking about immigration, you know, and, and, and using that rhetoric as a fear tactic. There are people in our community. We're a welcoming community. We care deeply about everybody in our com in our community, um, and. There's fear out there, and so people took to Facebook. They didn't call and say, "Hey, here's my concern." And this is this is just a change that's going on in the world today. Like normally, you pick up the phone and you'd call somebody of authority and say, "Let me share what my concern is, Bob." Mm -hmm. Okay, my concern is with everything, the rhetoric and everything else that people aren't. But they took to Facebook. They you know quickly concocted this. This is Department of Homeland Security ICE. They're rounding up immigrants. Uh, the person um, who 
uh, Kimberly, the emergency management director, you know, people showed up. She said, oh, no, 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 that's not what we're doing. Come on in. She gave people tours, this and that, but it didn't sort of stop it. Um, I, you know, went on there and said, um, which I normally don't chime in on comments and things like that, but I wanted to, to make a statement that, you know, public safety and being a welcoming city are not mutually exclusive. Our number one priority at the fair is to make sure that people are safe, okay? It is not, we are not rounding up immigrants here. We are not letting ICE into Evanston, uh, you know, welcoming them in to, to do that, okay? That is not the position of, of this city. It's not the position of our police department. Um, and, you know, I certainly wish that somebody had called and said, hey, I've got this concern, but generally it's just people jumping onto social media and, and riling, you know, some, pe some people up. Um, you know, moving forward. So what we ultimately did is the next day we said, you know, all right, we'll move the command center. So we moved it to a, a more discreet location, still nearby. We put a dump truck there instead, or a garbage truck there instead. So we say it, same purpose. Um, now people have sent me a petition and said, I want you to commit never to have any of these, you know, command vehicles in Evanston. I'll tell you right now, I'm not going to commit to that. If something were to happen in this city, if we were to have an active threat or an active, active shooter, I want all the resources that we can get from the state government and the federal government here helping us, you know, respond to the incident and protect our residents. That is my number one priority. And, um, yeah, so I'm not going to do that. That same van that people were upset about at Custer Street was here two weeks earlier. Nobody said a word, okay? And it was here for Dillo Day uh, and parked over at Maple and, and um, Foster, and nobody, and nobody said things. So uh, I recognize and I do want everybody in this community to feel like this is a welcoming community. Sure. I do recognize that on the face you go there and look at this big vehicle and it's imposing, right. okay, and it's dark and it's gray and all of that. I know our county commissioner, Larry Suffren, who I've been in communication with, is trying to get the, the agency renamed just to emergency services, um, the Cook County, uh, to, to help. Again, I'd remind people before you know, President Trump was here, it was still called the Department of Homeland Security and Emergency. You know, so, uh, you know, sometimes I love that people in Evanston, we all have big hearts and we do care and we want to be welcoming. But um, sometimes I think that, um, you know, we take it to an extreme or we, we just jump on social media instead of really trying to solve the problem. And to solve the problem would have been calling the fire chief or the police chief or myself, but that didn't happen. Right, right. Um, unnamed, that's... that's yes, that's the person, uh-huh. <laughs> Usually those are the best questions. No. <laughs> it's, a, it's a fairly juicy one. Uh, why are you taking the FOIA <clears throat> responsibilities, Freedom of Information Act responsibilities away from the clerk's office. Okay, so this is the question about FOIA, so Freedom of Information Act, uh, and this one uh, came up recently uh, because I, over the last two years, the FOIA requests, uh, which I'm a big supporter of FOIA, okay, so FOIA is sunshine laws, all right? It basically means that, you know, I can have access as a resident to the communication that is going on or the agreements or contracts that are going on here in the city. And in an ideal world, you just call up and ask for it. Hey, can I, can I have this piece of information? And that happens a lot, and the city gives it. Uh, a mechanism that was put in place over 60 years ago or so um, at the federal level is Freedom of Information Act, which cements in law that residents or anybody can ask and see information. Uh, there's a couple things that are protected, you know, attorney-client privilege information uh, and, and so forth, um, but that residents can have open access to this information. In the last two years, uh, we have gone from 700 uh, FOIA requests a year to over 1,400 FOIA requests. We, uh, the arbitrator of a FOIA request, so and you're a reporter, so you would sure. pass FOIA things. The arbitrator is if you feel like the city didn't give you the information that you were asking for or overly redacted a document, the arbitrator is you could appeal that and file a complaint with the uh, attorney general's office here in, uh, in the state of Illinois. And they have a special division that all they do is look at this, FOIA violations, Open Meeting Act violations, and you would, you would send it to them. Uh, two years ago in the past, we had generally two to three uh, complaints filed with the attorney general. We've now had over fif uh, 15 
uh, annual complaints are being filed with them. So that's increased fivefold. So given the significant increase of FOIA requests, um, I suggested to the city council that we have additional FOIA officers. Um, one thing that, that folks should know is it's pretty typical in communities uh, all around the United States that there are multiple FOIA officers. This is a admin simple administrative procedure person makes a request, you fulfill the request. There are clear delineations and lines in terms of what you need to do as a you know, public employee to fulfill that request. Um, it came down in a roundabout way that it was only one FOIA officer here. It was the, an elected official. To my knowledge, we are the only city with an elected of one, and we had you know 1,400 the city to have additional FOIA officers. And uh, the city council agreed, um, and uh, they passed it. And we uh, now have a FOIA officer at the police department, a FOIA officer at the uh, in the law department, uh, and a, a backup FOIA officer. Clerk Reed is still remains a FOIA officer. We didn't remove him as a FOIA officer, um, but we have additional ones. And again, that is consistent with lots of other cities. Uh, we're not doing anything illegal here. Uh, we continue to be committed to transparency and accountability. Uh, but the city council has also said, you know, this is a function that should also be held by, you know, um, people that are accountable here to um, others in the city. That if they're not doing their job, you know, we can we can come down on them. And it's not just an elected official. That's the sole uh, the provider of being the FOIA officer. I think there's some concern, though. Y yes. <clears throat> I understand what you're saying about accountable, mm -hmm. but there's also there was also kind of a a question of independence that, that going through the city clerk, more of an independent uh, you know person removed from the city apparatus, yeah. as opposed to the officers that are going to be right. fielding these right. these complaints right. uh, now. And the other thing is, an appeals to the attorney general office, as you know, that can. It can wear on, and you know that can that can that can certainly. I mean, that can wear on. I would tell you that the appeals to the attorney general office, to my knowledge, have been favorable to the city, saying that the city was following the rules, okay, and and properly and properly complying. You know, to your to your point about, um, you know. The idea, and again, this wasn't, uh, you know, uh, you know, the rationale or anything. It, it was, the it was, the, it wasn't right. the impetus. The impetus is, and I had been inquiring about this long, long ago about how many requests are sure. coming in, and every, and everything. But just um, intellectually, to have the conversation uh, that you just raised. Um, okay, so let's say you say no. I want to know that it's an elected official that's in charge. Okay, and let's say you think, hey, you know what? Uh, Clerk Reed is absolutely the person that I think would be a great FOIA officer. Well, how would you feel if two weeks from now it was Steve Haggerty? The mayor was the FOIA officer. Maybe you like me and think Steve's an honest guy. Okay. Or maybe you don't. Maybe you think Steve is a corrupt guy, don't like him. How would you feel then? The fact of the matter is if you use an elected official as your FOIA officer, you potentially could weaponize and politicize information that otherwise should just be a bureaucratic process. And when you have a bureaucrat doing it, it's exactly what it is. And if the, you know, and so I would say, look, if, you know, the, the legislators who made this law thought it was important that it be an elected official, then they should have passed the law and said it's an elected official that's the FOIA officer. But, uh, but to your point, I personally, just intellectually talking about this, um, don't think it's in the best interest that it be an elected official that is the one that is deciding whether you get information or not get information. Well, I don't want to get hung up on the elected official, but I, I think that um, there's concern about you know independence in, in terms of you know if I go through the I have a freedom of information request in front of the police department, maybe it's a little sensitive and this and that and and but they're making the call on it really. And maybe I won't uh, get that information. Maybe I will have to go to the attorney general's office. So, so let me ask you I, this. Let me ask you this, Bob. So let's say that um, you are um, you have an interaction with the police department, right. okay? And um, you're not arrested, which right. is the vast majority of interactions that our police department have. But one of the things that we've done is we've outfitted all of our police offices with body worn cameras. And so you have an interaction with a police officer. Um, who do you think should have access to that video of you with the with the person and you weren't arrested? Privacy concern. And well, and that was and I, mm -hmm. I heard that in connection with your you know mm -hmm. with this decision, right? 
Right. I mean, this decision again was about um, you know the volume and the increase right. of, fo of, FOIA, of 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 right. of FOIA requests and stuff like that. But again, just intellectually, you know, to to have this kind of conversation, um, do you think, or does anybody that's watching this video, you know, who do you think when you're not arrested? Um, should see that video because okay. the, the way that the law works, as I as I understand it, if any of us are arrested, anyone can FOIA that video, um, and you've lost your right to privacy. But again, the vast majority of interactions with the police, you're not. But sometimes people still have interactions and they're like, I wasn't happy with that. I want to see the the video footage. If you request that video footage, okay, um, and the police process it right now, the police maintain it. And the police pro and the police process it. It's going directly to the subject of the video or to your attorney. That's the only one that sees it, and we're complying with that. Why should somebody else see that video? Okay, uh, got to get these questions in. Sure. Uh, uh, Ali Harnett, I love this one. Will Evanston ever have a public pool? Man, Allie, yeah, every 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 there. kid in town has been asking me this question too. I would love to see us have a public pool, uh, but I do not think, uh, at least anywhere in the near future, do I see a public pool um, in the uh, in the horizon. Um, just again, given sort of you know the financial commitments that we've made um, in our current financial condition, I just don't think that that we've got the means to have a public pool here. Um, we do have five shark-free beaches. Okay, <laughs> I do want to stress that, and it is a hot day. Uh, but I do recognize, uh, having kids myself, that a pool and a beach are different, and there's something really nice about a pool for for a kid, but. That's where we are there. Allie has a second sure. question. How will the recent passage of the resolution to end structural racism <clears throat> change the process by which development uh, city council decisions are made? That's, hmm. interesting that's great. That's a great. Yeah. That's a great question. So I think the and what she's referring to is the reconciliation resolution uh, that the council um, approved uh, unanim unanimously. I would add. Um, I think that's a first. I think that's a first step. Okay. I think that again to um, you know become more equitable to break down systematic racism in Evanston, institutional racism, and all of that. Uh, that we're going to see come out through policies and practices, and you'll see uh, you know the Equity and Empowerment Commission, which has now been stood up for a year. We're going to start to see in the next year them start to come forward with specific you know um, policies, practices, um, education, training, all that kind of stuff, community wide. Uh, right back. We're almost done here. We're almost finished. Oh Time my gosh! Wow. <clears throat> right back to the uh, outstanding uh, Lynn Linia. Yes. Like the way that name uh, uh, goes. Uh, she asks, "What has been your greatest accomplishment since being elected?" Oh boy. Lynn, I'd say look at <laughs> that's a tough that's a tough one because because I don't view I don't view my role as you know one specific thing right I'm the mayor for all all of Evanston um, I have you know deep concern for social justice I have deep concern for you know econo economic development um, here in Evanston I care a lot about the climate right um, and so you just take those those three right there um, you know if you looked at social justice I'm really proud of the work that we've done over the last two years with alternatives to arrest mm -hmm. okay where we're taking you know situations where we had you know minors and other young adults who were going to the Cook County Court and now they're going to be heard here okay and that's that's really good for our community it's good for these young people and it doesn't create you know a long record uh, and um, and they're still held accountable for not you know sort of following rules so I think that's a really positive one in that area when it comes to you know development I mean the fact of the matter is is, uh, you know, we've got a thousand new housing units, you know, that are transit oriented design downtown. That means, you know, more people downtown expanding our tax base, good for our restaurants, good for good for our businesses, good for the environment. There's going to be a lot less cars uh, because people are using public transportation down there. Um, you know, again, it means that we can support having a target downtown um, and, all the, and all those other good things that are going on there. So I'm really proud of that. On a beautiful day like today, 
I'm really proud of what we've done over the last two years with the bike lanes on Chicago and Sheridan and with uh, Fountain Square. You go to Fountain Square right now, there are going to be parents down there with the kids running through uh, the fountains, people, business people out there eating their lunch. It's just a, a, a really good place. Um, I, will, I will wrap up by saying, you know, I just came back recently from the U.S. Conference of Mayors. We have our annual meeting. I get the opportunity to interact with mayors from all around the United States. Um, despite the fact that we're still a work in progress and you know we have challenges here in, in Evanston, we have so much good going for us as a community. And I, and I just don't want us to forget that when we're in the heat of the moment at city council meetings uh, or, or working through some of these really challenging issues. Well, we want to give shout outs to uh, all these uh, excellent, uh, excellent. Um, questions we received. Um, shout out to Ali, Mara, Mary, Sydney, Mike, Lynn, Kathy, Lisa, Mark, Janet, P PG, I believe it is, uh, Linda, Rachel, Robert, Jess, Dan, Tom, Wendy, Sylvia, uh, Misty, Kelly, and more. If I missed any of your questions, it all falls on me. The mayor was really ready to, you know. I, 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 I can, I, more, the more the yeah, greater. I have to absolutely, have to absolutely. Here. If there's a bunch others, we can do this again. We can do this again sometime. I'm happy, happy to do that. I, that'd be so, great. Absolutely. Be great. Thank, so I, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Bob. It's been a I appreciate it. It's been a okay. Pleasure.